Hi everyone, thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Felicia Garcia. I'm the Curator of Education at the School for Advanced Research's Indian Arts Research Center. Uh, just a reminder that we recently launched a new virtual membership option that welcomes you into our SAR community with access to all of our online programming. Our virtual memberships offer new members a way to get involved for just $25 a year. You can also always make a donation. Your support helps SAR's, uh, SAR keep our online programs accessible and free to a broad and diverse audience. So we'll include that link for you all as well. We always appreciate any support. Let's see, it looks like we have a good amount of people who've tuned in here, so let's get started. Um, thank you all for joining us uh, for this virtual artist talk and live Q&A with SAR's 2021 Ronald and Susan Dubin Native Artist Fellow, Lehua Wakea. For those of you just tuning in, my name is Felicia Garcia. I'm the Curator of Education at the Indian Arts Research Center. The School for Advanced Research is located on Tewa land in Ogapoge, which means white shell water place. Surrounding our campus are the landscapes of Pueblo, Apache, and Navajo communities, whose people all continue to maintain vital connections to this place. As an institution that's privileged to steward indigenous cultural material and committed to uplifting indigenous voices, we strive to maintain respectful and mutually beneficial relationships with these communities. So we not only honor their ancestral stewards of this land, but celebrate their past, present and future. Um, before I introduce our speaker, just a note for our viewers, after we watch the pre-recorded presentation, uh, Lehua will be joining us for a live Q&A. So please submit any questions that you have using Zoom's Q&A function, which you can access by clicking on the Q&A icon at the bottom right of your Zoom window. Uh, tonight, we are here to virtually celebrate 2021 Ronald and Susan Dubin Native Artist Fellow Lehua Uakea, originally from Papa Aiko on Moko o Kiave in Hawaii. Lehua is a Kanaka Maoli or Native Hawaiian artist who creates traditional kapa uh, that is hand stamped with patterns made from natural earth pigments and plant dyes. The patterns are created using stamps that are handmade from bamboo. Lehua has explained that this practice is a form of storytelling that expresses both traditional and contemporary topics, themes, and ideas. In their application, Lehua emphasized the importance of the intergenerational nature of kapa making. They have been working in the medium for about six years or so and are the first kapa maker in their family line in at least seven generations, but it is Lehua's lifelong goal to ensure that they will not be the last. During their time on campus, Lehua has created a series of kapa with hand stamped patterns that range in size from about eight inches by 12 inches to larger works that are over four feet in length. Uh, like all of our artist fellows who have been in residence over the past year, Lehua has had to adapt to many changes due to the pandemic and our campus closure, but I've been lucky enough to visit their studio a couple of times over the course of uh, Lehua's residency and the work that they have completed is absolutely incredible. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what they have to share with us tonight. And of course, we will be sorry to see Lehua go, but we hope or we look forward to hopefully having them back on campus in the future when we are once again open to the public. Uh, you can stay up to date on Lehua on their work through their website, lehuawakea.com. We'll also paste that link in the chat. And lastly, before I begin, I just wanted to take a moment to thank Ronald and Susan Dubin for their generosity in supporting this fellowship. We are extremely grateful. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming Lehua Uakea. Hi, my name is Lehua Uakea, and I am a Native Hawaiian artist and kapa maker. I am the 2021 Dubin Native Artist Fellow here at School for Advanced Research. Um, today I'm going to be talking a little bit, a bit about my practice leading up to this point over the past year, and what I've been busy with at SAR for the last couple of months. So a little bit about my background. I was born in Oregon and raised on the big island of Hawaii in a small town called Papaiko. And it wasn't until I moved back to Oregon when I was about 15 that I really started feeling a void in my work and in my life and wanted to 
reconnect and reclaim cultural practices that I grew up with as a kid back home. And once I began college, and that's when I really started getting into carving and cultural practices like kappa making. And for those who aren't familiar, kappa making is a traditional textile practice made from the bark of certain trees. Uh, specifically, we usually use the welke or paper mulberry tree. And um, in this slide here, you can see me using and harvesting a welke tree about 18 months old, just under two inches in diameter. And this is the tree that we use to make this textile cloth. This cloth was very ubiquitous in traditional Hawaiian culture. Your clothes were made out of this fabric. Um, ceremonial purposes, it was also used for bedding. Babies were wrapped up in it when they were born, and as you were being buried after you passed away, uh, your bones or your remains would be wrapped up in kappa as well. So it was really something that we were surrounded by all the time, and I am the first kappa maker in my family for at least seven generations. So to be able to bring this back to my lineage is an honor and a privilege, and I'm really happy to be, have been doing this here in Santa Fe. So this is a little bit about, or this is a little sample of what the, the first beading of the cloth can look like. Um, here I am holding up a really brightly colored piece of welke that has been just freshly beaten almost right off the tree. So we strip it and process it, clean the sap out, and this is the finished product um, after one beating, and you can continue beating it for several more times to create an even finer, more processed cloth that I would then paint on, print on, or use as clothing or make a painting out of. So here at SAR, I've been really uh, immersed in my practice for the first time in a really long time, especially coming out of COVID where I was very isolated and limited as to where I could go to make this work. It's not a quiet practice, so it it's not very urban friendly for all of my neighbors back in Portland where I was before this. So being here in Santa Fe where everything's kind of more spread out, I've really been able to make kappa anytime that I want. And it's been really, really fun. And one of the bigger pieces that I've been working on, I'm starting to wrap up now as I'm entering my last couple weeks. And here's a picture of me just a few days ago, actually um, putting a patch on some of the thinner parts of the large cloth. And it's a multi-step process involving harvesting the tree, uh, stripping the bark, processing it, cleaning the sap out, and fermenting the cloth, or what's called redding. And that allows the cellulose fibers to break down and become sticky and easier to work with, especially when creating larger pieces of the textile. Back home, this is my teacher. He's the one who kind of started me in all of this work several years ago, and his name is Wesley Sen, but I just call him Uncle Wes. And he's based on Oahu, not my home island, but uh, our connection came about because roughly 60 years ago, my grandma was the one who babysat him when he was a young child. And when they ran into each other again a few years ago, she told him about the work that I was doing, and he was more than happy to teach me whenever I was ready. And so he's been an amazing teacher and resource and elder for me to look to in order for me to become part of the next generation of kappa makers in my community, even though I'm not always back home learning. So when I do go back home, I always make it a point to see him. And this is from our last visit together. This was back in April of this year. So not that long ago. And the, the material that I harvested with him at that point, just a few months ago, is the material that I brought here to SAR. 
And so just a little bit of uh, work that I've been doing up until this point um, over the last year or so, especially during the pandemic, I really got into making smaller pieces, especially since I didn't have the means or the space to create larger pieces as I have been making here at SAR. So I really enjoy making smaller pieces. These are all paintings on the kappa, the bark cloth. And all of the pigments that I use are earth pigments that I've collected and harvested myself, most of which are from Oregon, where I was based before coming here. Uh, this one is particularly special to me because it showcases a range of the natural dyes and also uh, the earth pigments. So we have plant dyes that I made myself and earth pigments that I've collected and it's a whole range of color from red to orange, yellow, green, and even blue. And the blue is one of the rarest earth pigments that you can find. And so I really try to use natural pigments when I'm working with kappa just because it is more sustainable that way, as opposed to using something like oil or acrylics. It's a lot less chemical. It's a lot less uh, residual harm on the environment. and if I really wanted to, I could just take these pieces and bury them in the earth and have no uh, negative impact on the soil or, or uh, water or any other organisms. So that's really important to me. And also using uh, natural earth pigments and plant dyes allows me to have a closer relationship to my environment than I would otherwise with store-bought materials or things like that. And this is a piece that I completed right before coming to SAR, particularly about the, the energy and the force of wildfires and our natural ecosystems. And the, the red you see here comes from the Oregon desert and the black comes from wildfire ch charcoal that uh, Portland saw a lot of wildfires in surrounding areas uh, last summer, about a year ago from now, and um, it really opened a lot of people's eyes as to the effect that human communities have on our non-human communities. And so um, seeing all of that come full circle and start to affect us in negative ways, this piece was a, really about how if we don't honor those natural systems and powers that are greater than us, those actions will come back mirrored to us in really unfortunate ways, but sometimes it's necessary for us to learn the hard way, as my grandma would say. And this is another example of a combination of earth pigments and plant dyes. And this was actually the first piece of kappa that I had ever made several years ago, and I just hadn't painted on it up until about a year ago. I was just waiting until the, the right moment and the right image to put on it. And so you'll notice a lot of the work that I do besides kappa and pigment and uh, plant dyes is the patterns that I use. And all of the patterns that I put down in my work, they're not just arbitrary. They all hold a special meaning and significance, not just to my culture, but to my personal community and to me personally as an individual. So you'll see some, a lot of triangle motifs, which is a common motif that you'll see throughout Hawaiian art and material culture and tattooing. But um, there's quite a few other patterns that you'll see in a couple pieces I'll show later that are more specific to my experience as an individual. And I think it's really important for me to use both of these because it, it encourages people to see kappa as something that is evolving and constantly in flux rather than something that is static and rooted in the past. So much of what I do is resisting those ideas that our work and our culture is something ancient, something non-contemporary and as a contemporary Native Hawaiian it's important for me to not only bring these ideas and these practices and ways of thinking into a current 
context, but also preserve them for future generations and allow those generations ahead of me to evolve and to take these ideas into a relevant, a relevant mode for them in the future. And part of that is also making my own tools. It's really important for me to, like I'm connecting with my plants and my paints, it's also important for me to connect with the process through carving my own tools. And so this is one of the beaters that I use. We call it an ie kuku. And this has four sides. Each are patterned differently and each side has a specific purpose. There's two watermark sides on this beater and those watermarks are used at the final stage of beading to imprint a watermark into the fibers of the cloth that you can see when you hold it up to the light. And two other sides of the beater are used to spread and felt the fibers during the more preliminary stages of the beading. And so as I mentioned earlier, this is more of a, a really good example of a combination of more traditional patterns as well as patterns that are more specific to my own experience and my own visions. And so I don't really ever sketch my designs out or my patterns or really premeditate any of that. It's more very intuitive and that's how I like to work as um, that's how my kupuna or my ancestors would have worked. And so this piece came to me a few weeks ago when I was here at SAR and uh, this one specifically is about Haumea, which is our, you could say like goddess or entity of childbirth and creation and fertility. And so the patterns that you'll see here in this piece are all reflective of the mythologies surrounding her domain and her energy and her story and, and how she takes form in the physical plane. And here's a full view of that piece. Just for reference, this piece is about 27 inches by 32, and it is a lot smaller than the, the large piece that I'm working on now. But I've really had a lot of fun making these pieces here. There have been a lot of ideas that I've wanted to work through, and I've had the, the space and the time and the resources to do so here at SAR. Yeah, I think this one this one might be one of my favorites so far. And if you look closely, you can kind of see the the feminine energy kind of resonating throughout this piece, especially with the central diamond motif. This is another um, piece that I've completed in the last few weeks here. You can see the red and blue pigments. Again, those are all natural. They're no artificial or acrylic or any unnatural dyes used in this piece. And again, with the patterns, uh, they do tell a story. And this one is more contemporary. It's definitely more an innovative use of the patterns and the material rather than sticking to a purely traditional application of these methods. Um, and so this one is specifically about all of the different forms of kinolao or earthly presences that our, our gods and spirits have on this realm. And it's really about how they're always with us. They're always here, even if they're not physically here in spirit, they are here all around us all the time. And Hawaiians say that we have four gods, 40 gods, 400, and 40,000. And this replication and amplification of our uh, God entities and energies uh, is really evident in seeing how the negative space and positive spaces are both honored in this piece. And that's something I really try to do. I try to use the positive space as much as I use the negative space. And that is coming from a more traditional way of working. That's something that our ancestors would have done because um, what we do is just as important as what we don't do. And this is more of a kind of literal piece. Um, 
This is another one here at SAR. I've had a fun time making small pieces as well as this one really large piece that I'll show in a moment. But this one is uh, specifically about Hawaiian sovereignty and the history of the Hawaiian kingdom. Some people don't know that my people were illegally overthrown by a group of businessmen backed by the United States government. And this, this action imprisoned our queen in her own home and caused a lot of damage to the Hawaiian people, our government, our society, our communities, and our culture to the point where our language was outlawed, our dances were outlawed. And this also contributed to the, the near loss of kapa within our families. So this piece in particular talks about, or it references um, the song Kaulana Na Pua, which means um, famous are the flowers. And it was a song written after the, um, the taking of our lands and our, our government by these foreign entities. And the line that I use here is, Uolava ma koi kapo haku. And that means we are satisfied with the rocks. When members of the Royal Hawaiian Band were told by the, the fake government of a stolen Hawaii, they, they said that you guys must pledge allegiance to this new government and renounce all ties to your Hawaiian kingdom. And otherwise, you're going to eat rocks. And members of the band said, well, we are satisfied with the rocks. Because the rocks are all that they honor. It gives us life. It gives us everything that we need. The land is who we are as people as well. So of course we would be satisfied with that. And this song honors the, the resilience of our people and looks toward a future that resonates with a lot of Hawaiians where we see ourselves as sovereign once again. And on the 31st of July, we just celebrated La Ho'i Ho'i Ea, which is Sovereignty Restoration Day. And this is um, kind of what fueled the desire to make this piece. And so if you look towards the bottom of this slide, you can kind of see the large piece that I've been working on here. Uh, it's really a multi-step process that I started on my third day here at SAR and will probably finish in about a week. So just under eight weeks of work. And this large piece will measure about two and a half to three feet by 10 feet or 11 feet. And it is the combination of about six trees all together beaten and felted as one single cloth. And so it involves a lot of fermentation process, a lot of beating and subsequent beatings. And my goal for the last couple of weeks that I'm here is to finish the cloth and have it ready for decoration and painting by the time that I leave. And um, this will be the biggest cloth that I will have made up until this point. So I'm really learning a lot throughout the process and it's been amazing so far to be able to create something like this so far away from my home back on the Big Island. It's kind of a funny thing to be bringing this work to the desert where it's like a polar opposite of back home for me. It's very lush where I'm from close to the ocean, so many different broadleaf plants and flowers and uh, just plants that I'm familiar with. And here it's a lot of cacti and pines and junipers, which is also very beautiful. But I think that stark contrast in environment is a really good teacher for me, especially as I try to work to um, include ideas and themes of resiliency and resistance as Kanaka Maoli or Native Hawaiian people in my work. Um, 
and just considering the history of Native Hawaiians, we, we are voyagers, just like many Polynesians and Pacifica people, our ancestors, um, our navigators, and we are working to bring that back in a contemporary context. And so our people went all over. Um, we even have stories of them making it up to Alaska and the California coast and all the way down into places like Peru or Chile and many stops in between. And so coming here to Santa Fe, I wonder, it makes me wonder if there were any Hawaiians that passed near or around here hundreds or thousands of years ago, even before there was um, any colonial history being written. So for the rest of my time here at SAR, my goal is to finish this large piece which I will then take back with me to the Pacific Northwest and um, start to decorate and paint. A lot of what I also talk about with my work and my patterns is our impact on the environment, which I kind of alluded to earlier. And this long piece will be almost a sort of tapestry that discusses our relationship to the ocean and how rising ocean levels and ocean temperatures are affecting human communities and vice versa, and how it is a very detrimental thing, especially to people who are ocean people. Mm -hmm. Hawaiians, we trace our, our cosmology or our origin stories to the very bottom of the ocean. It begins with the smallest coral polyp, which in terms of evolutionary science, that is very accurate considering that you know Hawaiians, that was the smallest thing that they could see at the time, the smallest coral polyp, and it leads to more and more complex animals and organisms, such as seaweeds, plants, working up to animals, birds, and then finally humans and other creatures as well. And so our Hawaiian science is, is very in-depth and understanding of our environment and that hasn't changed, even though we are here in 2021 and looking towards the future. I hope to create this work to raise awareness about our impact on the environment and especially how it's impacting us as Native people. Islands are a microcosm of all the problems that we see in our world, but also all of the good things that can happen once we address those problems. And so that is where I see my work going here from here on out at SAR. And I'm really grateful for this opportunity to have come here and talk about these things and create this work. So mahalo. Wow, thank you so much for that uh, incredible presentation. I'm excited to get into this Q&A and hear more about your work and your practice. Um, we already have a couple of questions here in the Q&A box, uh, but please feel free to uh, type your questions there if you have anything you'd like to ask Lehua, and I'll be sure to relay uh, your questions. All right. Welcome, Lehua. Thank you for that presentation. Yeah, mahalo everyone for being here. So, um, well, I will just kick it off with some of my own questions here, and then we'll... Um, start looking to the Q&A box. Um, you, so you talked about this a little bit in your uh, presentation, but what was it like to create kapa here in the high desert? Uh, I imagine, the, I mean, I know the climate is very different from Hawaii and Oregon. So did you have to adapt your practice at all? Yeah, um, the biggest difference that I noticed was because it is so dry here, in the desert, um, I kept having to re-wet my materials and my tools um, like multiple times throughout the process, which is something I'm not used to. Um, you know, we, water is a really important part of this process. And um, I think in the desert that it was only amplified uh, even more, it became even more clear. Um, so yeah, it was, it was really interesting trying to adapt my process um, to such a different environment, like on the opposite end of the spectrum from what I'm used to. Oh, I think you're muted. 
Thank you. Over a year of Zoom and I'm still uh, muting myself, but um, just on that same track, how has your time um, on campus and in Santa Fe influenced or inspired your work? Have you uh, created any new stamps or pigments during your time here? Yes, I have created um, quite a few of new hand painted patterns, which I showed in that like a uh, three and a half foot piece or three foot piece um, about home with the red pigments. Um, but as far as hand carved um, ohe kapala or the, the bamboo stamps that I use, um, I did carve one new stamp um, and that one is going to be a gift in reciprocity for someone. So um, I'm excited to share that in a little while, but I cannot share it yet just because I like surprises and I want it to be a surprise. That's so exciting. I'm looking forward to maybe seeing it if you share. Um, let's see, we have a couple of questions here. So I'll go ahead and read a few to you. So uh, Marilyn Poole says, Mahalo lehua wakea. You mentioned gathering pigments in Oregon. Do you also gather mineral or plant colorants from the big island? If so, what do you use? Yeah, it's been a while since I've had the chance to go back home um, to Hilo. Uh, so a lot of the plants, plant pigments that I use that are from back home are gifted to me. Um, for example, I did have some olena or turmeric gifted to me. That was another gift um, from an artist here in Santa Fe, Ian Kuali'i. Um, thank you. And uh, that one is a very brilliant yellow. Um, but other than that, I've uh, been able to gather um, some red ochre pigment from Oahu. Um, it's one of our most common pigments that we use uh, when we're not using plants. Um, but I do prefer to use uh, earth pigments over plant dyes just because they tend to last longer. They're less fugitive. Um, and what that means is their fugitive uh, plant dyes are very um, finicky. They can be very temperamental and sensitive to light or changes in pH. Um, over time. And so with the earth pigments, they're a little bit more stable. Um, they travel uh, easier and better. Um, but both ways of working have a really, um, really beautiful uniqueness to them. Great, thank you. Uh, we have another question here from Joy Poole who asks, is another name for kappa cloth also called tapa cloth? perhaps in other Pacific islands, is it also made from a mulberry tree? Uh, short answer is yes. Um, tapa, kapa, those are essentially the same thing. Um, bark cloth is used all around the Pacific. We also have specific names for them from other places beyond kapa or tapa. Um, siapo uh, is another word or natu in Tonga. Um, so each community kind of has their own uh, words for talking about this material, which is all around our ocean um, families. Uh, and although the paper mulberry tree is the most common and is the most uh, preferred just because of its, its fine fibrous content and very white fibers, um, we also use materials like the mamaki or the hibiscus we've used um, uh, the breadfruit or ulu uh, bark, uh, but those are a little bit more um, finicky to work with or leading to a much more rough or uh, brown colored cloth at the end. So most commonly you'll see us using um, the paper mulberry bark. I'm curious, have you ever, um experimented with creating kappa using the bark of uh, trees or plants that are found in Oregon or New Mexico, some of these other places you've lived? Uh, no, I have not yet. Um, most of that site specificity comes from the patterns that I use and the paints that I use to create them. Um, 
I really, really do want to try using mulberry bark, like with the actual berries on the tree. Um, it's like a cousin of the paper mulberry tree. Um, and I've used the berries to make dye before, but never used the actual bark to make cloth. Interesting. Um, let's see, we have another question here from Karen Solsky. Uh, thank you for the excellent video. You mentioned the colors you use are natural. What is the blue? Um, and then did you find in your learning about cloth production and pigments? How did trade between islands for pigments play a role historically in it all? So it's kind of a two part question there. Yeah. Um, so the blue is Vivianite. Um, in our, our cousins in Aotearoa or New Zealand, they call it Pukepoto. Um, we don't have a word for it um, in Olelo Hawaii because it's not a, a, a color that we really had um, historically, um, at least to my knowledge. Um, so that's, uh, it's an earth pigment, um, forms under very specific conditions. So it's very rare. Um, and did you find in your learning? Uh, in terms of trade between islands, um, as far as my knowledge goes, there wasn't really a need for pigment trade back and forth just because um, every island was so abundant and productive in terms of our dye plants, um, which ranged from using different kinds of barks, root, berries, flower preparations, um, as well as earth pigments. Um, you didn't really need to go source them from outside of your own ahupua or own moku, your own island or district where you were living. Uh, so it was all pretty much where you needed to have access to it very immediately. Um, and patterns, um, are patterns handed down in a family? Uh, yes and no. Um, in some parts of the Pacific, it's very um, specific to each family line or lineage. Um, for example, in our tattooing, uh, the tattoos that I have on my leg, those are very specific to my ohana and no one can have an exact copy of what I have on my leg unless they're maybe my sisters, um, just because that is very specific to um, our, our lineage, our bloodline. Um, in terms of using patterns like on kappa, a lot of our patterns were stolen from us or lost so the meanings and the names and the significance for those um, have gone with them unfortunately so what we do have we need to be very careful of um, using if we're using older patterns um, so that's another reason why I tried to use patterns that I create um, based on uh, more traditional ways of thinking relating to our environment and then bringing in that into a contemporary context by creating my own new motifs that I can then pass down to my family the right way. Uh, that was a perfect segue into one of these other questions here. Uh, is there a certain age when someone is able to start making kappa? What is one important teaching for youth coming into kappa making? Um, I mean, I don't think there's any age too young as soon as they're old enough to hold a beater. Um, I mean, this one is pretty big. It's like, I don't know, maybe a foot and a half. Um, but we have cakey sized beaters as well. Um, and so once they're old enough to hold that, they're old enough to learn, in my opinion. And I've seen kids as young as maybe three or four starting to learn alongside their parents or their aunties. Um, and I think the, the younger that you start your, your kids or your grandkids learning, um, it really instills in them an appreciation and an understanding of where this knowledge comes from. And then deeper than that, a desire to help pass that on to the next generation.
Beautiful. I love that idea of a little baby uh, making kappa. <laughs> That's very sweet. Um, Karen says, excellent. Thank you for the answers. And Joy adds, thank you for carrying on the kappa traditions of your islands. Um, we have a question here from, oh, let's see. Sorry, I want to make sure I don't miss anyone's questions. Um, Ashlyn Weaver asks, did you find a sense of connection back to Hawaii and producing kapa while living in mainland? Did kapa making take on a larger role in your life because you are so far from home? Great question. Uh, short answer is yes, absolutely. Like a thousand percent. Um, without kapa, I would not be the person that I am today. And that, you know, says a lot about um, my connection with my community, my land, my elders, my culture, um, my language, um, just taking on this work and this role um, has really pushed me to reclaim a lot of parts, a lot of other parts of myself and my, my culture. Um, I started dancing again. I started learning how to speak my language more um, and being a bigger part of the native Hawaiian community that is up in the Pacific Northwest. And there's a lot of us. Um, and just being able to give back and give this knowledge to my community here on the continent has been um, just such an honor and a privilege. Um, I didn't grow up in, in high school uh, with this kind of connection. I felt very, um, isolated and uh, felt like the odd one out, you know, I felt like I was very alienated from the rest of my, my community back home. And so if I can just have a positive impact on the younger generations up here for them to know that they're not alone, that their cultures is very much worth um, being a part of and preserving and perpetuating. Um, that's like the biggest part of, of why I do what I do. Beautiful. Ian uh, comments, the kuleana is real. Um, Vincent Kukua says, no question, just mahalo for your work and beautiful representation of our people. Let's see, I'm scrolling up to some other questions here. Uh, we have one from Jameson Brandt who asks, how are the source materials transported to New Mexico? I'm just wondering about the difference in saltwater content from imported pulps and how the pigments would react in the desert. So uh, the pigment part of that question, um, pretty easy to transport just because I'm working with earth, earth pigments rather than primarily plant dyes. Um, so they're very stable. Um, I just carry them here in glass containers. Um, as far as the welke or the bark, um, I came here with um, about 10 of these. Um, and this is just the uh, like dried material right off the, the welke tree. Um, this is some of what I harvested back in April of this year with Kumu, um, Uncle Wes. Um, so I, I just carried it in my backpack with me, um, just stacks of these just rolled up in there. Um, and they travel pretty well because they're they're pretty like, like solid. I can't really even bend it. Um, other than that, I also carried about six trees worth um, that were already beaten out. Um, and those just fold up like blankets and I carry those in my suitcase. Um, so I try to have my kappa distributed through different bags so that if any, uh, anything happens to one of those bags that I still have material to work with. So it's like very strategic, I guess. Great. Um, let's see, uh, Ipo Ipo asks, uh, you talked about this a little bit, but what effect did the American invasion and colonial religions have on the making and use of kappa? Um, a lot. Uh, Hawaiians first were contacted by colonizers in 1778. Um, and ever since then, the, the change and the forced assimilation on our people was very rampant and rapid. Um, 
they looked at our, our people and our cultures and our traditions as something that was very um, savage. That's the word that they used to describe us. They used to, um, used to describe us as very uncivilized and um, just very brutish. And of course, that's not accurate at all. We very much knew what we were doing. We had a very, um, very developed society and um, they saw our clothing and especially when the missionaries came in the 1820s, um, they knew uh, that things were going to be changing. Our Hawaiian people knew that things were going to be changing and uh, white missionaries wanted us to have more modest clothing. And so our, our kappa was not modest enough for them. It wasn't refined enough for them. Um, it wasn't white enough for them. And so um, after that, you'll see uh, a very quick replacement of kappa with more um, colonial materials like linen and cotton used to make full length dresses, full coverage dresses um, that mirrored more uh, European styles. Um, the irony is a lot of uh, our patterns and our motifs at the time were used in Western or colonial European styles and fashions, you'll see our patterns printed into their textiles. So while they were saying that our clothing was uh, not good enough or not, um, not proper enough for them, they were still taking our um, designs and using them for profit elsewhere. Um, and I think that is just a really, uh, really good example of uh, colonization in our people. Um, but I'm very grateful that there are enough people now who are bringing it back and bringing these, uh, these ways of working and knowledge back to, to everyday life. Absolutely. Um... James Jameson says, fantastic presentation and answer to my question. Nice to see you, how you transport the park. Mahalo. I'm sorry if I mispronounce this. Nia Wen. The designs are so close to our Haudenosaunee. Very, very pre-colonial works, which were done first in quill and hair and then later in beads. So interesting. Um, let me see here. I'm trying to make sure I get to everyone's questions. Um, I'm going to ask one of my own questions because um, that's the perk of being the host here. Um, but it was so fun to uh, join you on your collections visit just a couple of days ago. And I'm curious if you could share what that experience was like getting to interact with all of the different uh, pieces that we have in the IERC. Yes, um, there are so many amazing pieces that I just have never really seen up close or other than like in pictures um, online before, things like that. Um, something that stood out to me the most was just how similar a lot of the patterns from Pueblo pottery are to the patterns that we use in kappa and um, tattooing in Hawaiian culture. Um, and even in parts of uh, other parts of the Pacific like Niue and Fiji, I saw a lot of similarities with the more um, curvature lines, the, the floral motifs that are seen in some of like the San Idelfonso pottery. Um, and that was really interesting to see how we as indigenous people um, kind of arrive at similar modes of storytelling, even though we're completely spread apart. Um, and I was having a conversation with uh, a family who's um, from the Santa Clara Pueblo, just outside of Santa Fe. And um, they asked me about the, the triangles that I have on my, my arms, because in their family, um, the triangle is like their, um, their symbol that their matriarch chose. And um, they were telling me about the symbolism of that in their own pottery, which is the black on black um, pottery and um, 
just like the work that we do as kapha makers, none of their patterns are arbitrary. It's all very specific and has a lineage to it as well. And so um, I just thought it was really interesting to see their triangle motifs used in really similar ways and um, how they're doing that now as contemporary native people and how that really draws a lot of parallels between um, my people as well as, as Kanaka Maoli. Yes, it was so beautiful that you were able to make those connections. Uh, Ian says, yes, it always trips me out how similar our pattern works are. Definitely. Um, let's see. Oh, Jameson also adds, forgot to say, early transfer was also in ribbon work. Interesting. Um, so I'm just going to, we have a couple of questions here in the Q&A and then a couple in the chat. So I'm going to try and get through as many as I can. Um, this one's kind of long, so I'll paraphrase it a little bit. I'm wondering if and how the local communities and diverse traditions in, in New Mexico have informed your work and consequently have informed your new textiles and pigments created at SAR. You kind of touched on that a little bit, but if you had anything else to add. Um, yeah, I think it's more so, but it's less like um, direct um, use of their patterns, I, that's not right. Like it's not right for me to use their patterns in my work, um, just like it wouldn't be appropriate for them to do that with my patterns and, and Hawaiian motifs. Um, but more so I've just been really inspired by the resilience of indigenous people all over. Um, and here in Santa Fe, there's, there's a really strong native presence here um, and people are making that just a part of their everyday life in their whole families. Like the family that I just spoke about, um, their whole family from their youngest grandchild to their, um, their elders, they're all learning this pottery and learning the patterns, um, learning the techniques that have been done for many, many generations and still gathering clay from um, the clay pits that are outside of their um their home for at least six or seven generations something like that so it's really um inspiring to see that uh this resilience and this um, reclamation is is um widespread it's not just um throughout the pacific of course but it's all over and um i think that movement is really powerful to be able to see on uh lands far away from my home. Absolutely. Um, Karen Solsky asks, on kapa making and oral history, are there any stories that are classically associated during the process of making the cloth and or decorating with designs? Uh, yes, there are. Um, because it was so prevalent in Hawaiian culture and everyday life, um, we have quite a few stories that are associated with um, Hina, who is the, the main um, uh, I don't, like energy or like, I don't want to say goddess because that's not really accurate, but just the main deity of um, kapa making. Um, yeah, as Ian says, Hina and Ku, they're kind of the duality, the, the coupling in our, in our mythologies. Hina was the kapa maker and she presides over kapa making um, and the moon and the moon also sh shines bright because of her, her brilliant kapa making. Um, and uh, yeah, there's actually many stories, not just about the kapa itself, but also the plant. Um, we have stories of people who were turned into the plant that made it possible for us to learn today. Um, and then also there are many chants that go along with um, harvesting the material and beating it out. And I'm still learning those as well. Um, but we say that when you learn the chants and uh, chant them out loud when you're harvesting the material or um, making the bark cloth itself, the material listens to you and you end up with a finer product at the end. Wow, thank you for sharing. 
Um, let's see, Mary Ann Onstott uh, comments, if you're interested, I can show you a Samoan tapa made by Mary Pritchard in 1982 for me as I left Samoa. It is a treasure. I realize Samoan traditions different than Hawaiian. So I can definitely maybe connect you, figure out a way to connect you to if that's something you're interested in. Sure. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Um, we have another uh, question from Angelica Trimbleyanu. Do you have any plans to experiment further with kappa making and bridge some unconventional ways of making? Or is it important for you to stay very close to your traditional modes of making? Beautiful work as always. Lehua Oakea. Oh, thank you. Hey, <laughs> um, we went to college together. Um, yeah, I mean, a little bit of both. I think it's important to learn our more traditional ways of working in order to be able to innovate new ways of making. Um, so while I, I do a lot of new pattern work and new like um, hand painting styles, um, the actual making of the bark cloth itself is very like rooted to tradition. Um, but one of, I will say the, the large piece that I'm making the, the, in the presentation I mentioned it was gonna be 10 or 11 feet. It actually ended up being like 12 and a half. Um, that piece will be showing in Portland in November. Um, and I'm really leaning towards the idea of cutting it up and hand stitching it back together um, in little squares. Um, so I'd still have a very long cloth, but using a more, um, a, a technique that speaks a little bit more to my personal background. Um, so that's kind of where I'm leaning towards. It's very important for me to use both ways of working um, and learning where all of this is coming from so that I can make uh, a new way of working, not just for myself, but, but for future generations too. Great. Um, and on that note, uh, Jay Aurelia Fleck kind of asked some questions related to a few that I had. Um, you started to talk about this a little bit, but um, what will you do with the pieces you've created at SAR? Yes, we'd love to hear what's next. Any exhibitions, residencies that are planned? Um, and Jay Aurelia also asked if your pieces are available for purchase and if they are, where we can find them. Um, yeah, those kind of go together. Um, so after I leave SAR, I have an exhibition in October and then another one in November. Um, I mentioned the large piece will be showing um, in November. That one will be at the Portland Art Museum. Um, in a show called Mesh with a few other indigenous artists. And the other pieces, the smaller ones that I've been making, like um, this is one that I didn't show in the presentation, but these smaller pieces will be showing at another gallery in Portland called Waterstone. Um, and uh, in terms of selling my pieces, I. I'm very careful about how I do that. I wanna make sure that they're going to a home that will appreciate them and understand where this work is coming from. Um, so I don't sell through any gallery or just through an online um, shop for my kappa. Um, I do sometimes take uh, custom commissions. Um, so if someone is interested in commissioning a piece of kappa, I will be able to um, have those conversations and make that um, arrangement uh, starting in December or January of next year. Um, I'm pretty busy for the rest of the year, which is good, um, but yeah. Great, thank you. Um, and then I think I, made it to all the questions in oh wait okay I missed one Ian will you be making more earrings soon um, I need to buy a couple of pairs for some super special wahine lol <laughs> um yes <laughs> I will be making more earrings soon um my online shop uh, Makali e is like where I sell my earrings and um, things like that. 
that is um, on a temporary hiatus since I've been focusing on my work here at SAR. Um, I will be reopening the shop sometime in September or October, hopefully. Great, thank you. Sorry, I thought I was muted here. Um, okay, we have one more question here uh, from one of our viewers. And then um, I have just one more question and we'll wrap up. Uh, we just wanna be mindful of your time. Uh, Mia Beta asks, does kappa making kill the trees from the bark you use? Um, yes, it does. But I will say it's a very sustainable process. Um, Welke or the paper mulberry tree grows almost like a weed. Uh, it was one of the canoe plants that our ancestors brought over to Hawaii when they were first settling in those islands. And if you cut down one tree, there's at least 10 other keiki or uh, sprouts that are growing up from the same rooting body. So you're never taking the whole root out unless you're trying to start your own grove elsewhere. Um, uh, so the tree itself um, is roughly about two inches in diameter um, when you harvest it. But at that point, because you've allowed that to grow for so long, there's already many other sprouts that are coming up um, from the same base. So it's very actually, um, it's very sustainable to harvest because then it allows room for those younger sprouts to grow and mature into plants that you would then use to repeat the process. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, there are a couple I didn't get to hear, so I apologize, but we're um, getting close to our time. I just wanted to ask if you could share, uh, what's the best way to stay up to date on your work and um, any exhibitions? We shared your website, but is there like a newsletter or your social media, uh, what do you recommend? Um, my website is good, lewuokea.com. I think that's in the chat. Um, my email is also on there as well um, if you wanted to reach out. But there's also a link to my Instagram, which is where I'm most active and most posting um, updates and things like that. And um, I can just, I guess, type that in the chat if that's like ideal. Um, it's basically just my name in between two underscores. Um, so follow me on there if you'd like to see some of my process, my tools, um, upcoming events, or just things like that, so. Great, thank you so much for sharing your presentation and um, all of your um, insights and knowledge during this Q and A, um, we're very appreciative. So um, yeah, thank you also everyone for attending. This has been a really great event.